A good Wednesday evening to you. This is Pastor Jones here at Valley Assembly of God welcoming you to our midweek oasis service. And what we have on Wednesday night, the portion you receive is the in-depth Bible study. We have been on a study now for a number of months on the danger lines in the deeper life. So this has not been pablum or milk that we've been feeding you on Wednesday night. This is the meat of God's word. And I hope that you have taken heed to what we've had to say and that you've grown uh, because of it in the things of God. The next two Wednesday nights, we're going to be talking about, once again, in the same vein of this study, religious compromises as we look into the book of Judges, the 17th and the 18th chapter. Now, tonight I want to use as my text, though, Matthew 6 and 24. And while you're turning to that, let me just remind you, we are here every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Our youth group meets, our children's ministries meet, um, and we'd love to have you be part of that. Sunday morning, 9 o'clock is the Bible study hour. 10 o'clock is morning worship with children's ministries going on. We're back Sunday night for our Sunday evening service. At the same time, we offer Royal Rangers and girls' ministries to the boys and girls. Monday is prayer meeting at 12 noon. And then we're back here to our Oasis service on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We hope <clears throat> as we begin to march down this path in this new year that we'll not get much farther before you will join us in some of these services. We'd love to have you be part of what God is doing here at Valley Assembly. Matthew 6 and 24. No one can serve two masters. Now, this is Jesus speaking. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon or money. For a few moments now, starting tonight and finishing next week, I want to talk to you about religious compromises. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your precious word that's open before us. We pray that you would just bring it alive to us right now, challenge us, help us, God, to examine ourselves, not others, ourselves, to see if within us there are some religious compromises that have been going on. Lord, just help us to be honest with ourselves and allow your word to do its needful work. We thank you for it ahead of time. We ask it all. In Jesus' name, amen. The remarkable incidents of Judges 17 and 18 illustrate the very principles found in Matthew 6 and 24. They contain the story of Micah and are a melody, melody rather, of sin and crime that condemned with the bitter irony of truth, the follies and sins of the dark ages of the judges. And they apply to the social and religious abuses of our own time. And if you've been around at all for any length of time, a number of years, you're probably like this preacher. You stand back shocked, appalled, at the social and religious abuses that are going on in this world in which we're living right now. The first thing that we see a picture of here is of dishonesty. Micah, a young man of Mount Ephraim, stole 1,000 shekels of silver from his own mother. And for a time, he hid the money from her. Finally, alarmed by her angry curses, he confesses he had taken the money and he gave it back to her. Now let's stop here for just a moment because there's a lesson in just that little picture. This is a common happening. Dishonesty and crime, you know where they begin? They begin in the home. You heard me right. 
with the first penny stolen from mom's drawer or dad's dresser. You know, I'm not as much appalled by the abuses sometimes we hear about today, physical abuse, and we never condone it. But I'm even more appalled by the, by the, the abuse of a parent not being a parent today. Where this kind of stuff comes up, it is, it is God's call upon you and I as moms and dads to raise our children before God, to train them that when they exit our home, they will be an outstanding citizen of society and not a criminal or a crook. From this, the person goes on to lead a life of lawless and crime. It always starts small. But like any sin, it escalates after, over a process of time. Absolute righteousness, even in the smallest of things, is essential to all. God's not calling us to cut corners. He's not calling us to be righteous most of the time. He's calling us to be righteous all the time. It's essential, my friends, to all religious character. We find a lack of righteousness today in society's concept of right and wrong. There are men and women who can speak of deep religious experiences and extraordinary public services who yet seem to be unable to appreciate the absolute necessity of strict integrity and uprightness in the matters of property and debt and business transactions. In other words, if you call yourself a man of God, you can't be a crook. You gotta pay your bills. You give your employer an honest day's work. The words that come out of your mouth edify, build up, strengthen those about you. Don't pollute their heart and mind with filth. Do we know what righteousness is today? Let me give you a simple definition. It means living right. Right in the eyes of God. Not just in the eyes of what is right in the eyes of men. Men today, their idea of right and wrong is so messed up. We go back to the word of God. I want to know what God perceives to be right and what God perceives to be wrong. Next, we see a picture of passion. When Micah's mother found that her money was missing, she became angry. Her curses made such an impression on Micah that he confesses to being a thief. The moment the shekels were returned, she forgot almost her, about all of her anger and about the fact that Micah had been the thief that stole them. She was so happy to have her money back that she probably forgot about punishing Micah. Instead, she blesses him. Let's be careful that we do not pronounce blessing on our children's behavior and activities that we know are wrong. Mom and dad, it's time for you to take the lead, even with your adult children, that they don't influence you to start moving away from God, but you influence them to get back to where they need to be in God. Are you hearing me? Compromise never accomplishes anything when it comes to the things of God. Then we see this worthless religion that this woman was a partaker of. And unfortunately, we've got a whole pile of worthless religious to, religions today that fill this world of which we live. As we continue in the account, we see a picture here of counterfeit consecration. I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a cast idol. Judges 17 and verse 3. What a strange medley of religion and idolatry. Micah's mother had religion. 
Well, listen to me. It was worthless. It was worthless. I want you to look into your heart right now and ask yourself what you have in God. Is it really worth something? Is it changing you? Is God using you to make a difference or is your religion dead? Without any passion, without any good works, without any heartfelt care for your fellow man. This woman had religion, but it was worthless. That can be said about way too many people in this world of which we live today. They've got religion, but it's worthless. The world's need is not religion. There's plenty of it to go around. In fact, the less a man has of God, the more he has of religion. That almost sounds odd, but it's true. I'm not serving God because I got religion. You would hear that years ago in camp meetings. Somebody gets saved, and inevitably there'll be somebody saying, he got religion. No, he didn't. He got saved. He got God in his heart and life. He got forgiven. Because religion, my friends, will kill you. Animus in Africa or the Hindus in India have far more religion than Christians in North America. He said, well, how can you say that? They sacrifice. They give until it hurts. And they do more in service to their gods than we do for Christ. You say, wait a minute. Explain that to me. Well, let me help you here. Coming to church on Sunday morning and sitting in a pew for an hour or an hour and a half is not really serving God. It's serving you. What do you do with what God has deposited within your heart and life? Are you impacting your neighbors and friends and family? Are you working in the church? Are you evangelizing everywhere you go? Are you making a difference? Because if none of that's going on, you're one of those individuals that has religion, but you really don't have God. My friends, these people sacrificed. They give in service to their gods. But unfortunately, theirs is the devil's religion. Good works will not get you to heaven. I don't care what the tag is on the religion you involve yourself with, even Christianity. We are saved by the grace of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But understand me, when Christ comes into a man and woman's heart and life, they get up and they get going for Jesus. They begin to work for the Lord. They begin to make a difference. But they never look to those things as their means of salvation because they're not. They are merely the fruit of what God has brought in their hearts and lives. Back of all their idolatry, they, like Micah's mother, have a dim idea of the Lord. Very dim. They will tell you that these things, these images and fetishes are but forms and stepping stones through which they can rise up to the true God. Untrue. That'd be my, me saying that you're unsaved if you'll just uh, carry a Bible around and come to church uh, every week. Uh, these are stepping stones to getting closer to God. No, many times they're the very things that deter you because you begin to trust in these rituals and forms and never step out of them to really come to know God as your own Lord and Savior and to really know what real salvation is all about. They, my friends, have a sense that there is a God or they wouldn't have any religion at all. They have a sense there is a God and they desire to meet him, but this does not make their practices any more acceptable. The motive does not make the act right. I know there'll be people one day that will stand before God in judgment and they will think because they had their name on a roll book or a membership card and they, they supported the church, maybe even financially, that they, they really were good to go, to go into glory. And they'll find out as the Lord looks on them because they never made a profession of faith. Jesus Christ did not live in their heart and life. And Jesus will look down at them and say, depart from me. I never knew you. 
Wait a minute, I was a church member. I never knew you. You didn't serve me. You served a religion. Similarly, we may have much piety in building our chapels, our churches, our altars, and contributing to the costly machinery of our splendid rituals and in keeping our fast in our various special services, but it is idolatry all the same. Somebody was telling me here a few months before Christmas that they were uh, working at a church that wanted to put up this mammoth 40 foot screen, I think he told me, in the front of the church. And mind you, they had a huge screen already up there. And it was going to cost an enormous amount of money. And the man said to the pastor, Why are you doing this? He said, I have to keep up with the church down the street. Folks, is this what it has come to? Is this, is this where we're at? We're in church because of the size of a screen or the type of coffee that's been brewed? Or whether we got three or five or ten people on the platform leading in worship. And, and you know what? That's a misnomer. They're not leading in worship. They're putting a concert on. God help us to get back to the basics and what God wants of you and I. And that is not to have mere idolatry. He wants us to know Jesus and to serve Jesus and to walk with the Lord on a day-by-day -day basis without compromise. My friends, it is a sad day for many devoted worshipers when they find that God has accepted none of their foolish sacrifices and that all their expenditures of money and time and bodily exercise has been as vain as the Muslims' prayers to Mecca. Will you notice Though in this woman's consecration, how she betrayed herself by an act of insincerity in the midst of her pretended sacrifice. She says here, I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord. That's what she said. And yet when it came to actual giving up the money, she only took out about 200 shekels. She kept the rest for herself. She was not even honest in the little religion that she had. Now, I happen to believe that tithing is still part of what the Christian is to do. And that means 10% of what I make, my income, belongs to God. He's blessed me in that because he leaves me 90%. But it, let's say I have a hundred dollars in my hand I've made. And I put five dollars in the offering plate and I act as if I have done my, my service to God. No, you didn't. You left out five bucks. It wasn't, it wasn't five that you should have put aside for God. It was ten. If you made a thousand, it's a hundred. If you made five thousand, it's five hundred. And yet we shortchange God. And we strut about as if we are doing that which is right in God's eyes when in fact we have compromised. Don't be a compromiser. Just give God his due and give it to him out of a heart of a love and appreciation. And then and only then are you going to really enjoy God's richest blessing. How natural it is to let self come into our devotions. We need to heed the admonition of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 11 when he said this. Now finish the work so that you eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. May that be said of you and I this evening. I want to start this next one, and then I'm going to close in prayer. Talking about man-made religion. We'll delve into this to a greater extent next week. We see here a picture of ritualism. Micah's mother had an image made and gave it to him to set up in his house. 
He had a shrine and he made an ephod and some idols and stalled one of his sons as the priest. Judges 17 and verse 5. Micah's religion was manufactured according to the pattern in his own heart and mind, not God's. I'm not wanting to have a church pattern after what I want. I want a church pattern after what God wants. But isn't that the problem today in our church world? Too many standing behind pulpits have hearkened to the demands and the wants of people in the world. And we've turned our churches into entertainment centers or coffee bars. And people are not getting saved. People are not getting changed. People live eyeball deep in sin. And we call it church. May God help us and deliver us from this. And this is the essential defect of all forms of false religion. They're man-made. Their basic fault is that they are human. That they are based upon the traditions or the adventures of a man and not upon the revealed word of God and the authoritative commandment of Jehovah. And let me just end with this. As we are not too far into this new year, can I urge, admonish, and encourage you to get back to God's word? It's not thus saith the man that we are needing to be concerned about. It's thus saith the Lord. If you obey, obey God's word, my friends, you'll be a happy person as you make your way through this new year. We'll pick this up about religious compromises next week. You will not want to miss the conclusion. Bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, thank you now for this time, for the truths of your word. I pray, God, may we take it to heart. We don't want a man-made religion. We just don't want to go through the motions. But, oh, God, we want to do that which is right in your eyes, no matter what it costs us or the price that must be paid. Father, I pray, may we take it to heart. And God, may we look to you and your word to guide our steps in a compromising world that we live today. Now, Father, keep us in your safekeeping until we meet again on Sunday. And Father, I pray, lay the groundwork for a great Sunday morning, we pray. We thank you ahead of time. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for coming our way again. I pray I've said something that maybe has challenged you. Maybe it's something you've not heard for a long time, but it's got you to thank you. And I pray that thank you is going to bring some change as you yield and lend yourself to God. We'll see you next time. God bless.